So, hello, welcome. Uh, welcome to our now February concode, uh, first of the year. Um, we'll have to start organising, we'll have to start planning these, we'll try and get some more books into the future. Uh, we have, I can see a few potential speakers right now uh, on the call. Um, so I uh, just like to kick off by introducing Giles. So Giles is a senior researcher in digital humanities in the Department of Engineering Science at the University of Oxford, uh, with an additional appointment as digital project officer at the History of Science Museum in Oxford. Giles is a uh, book historian by training. He broadly works on digitalization projects for museums and libraries, particularly those involving computer vision. And I hand it over to Giles. Thank you, Bab, very much for that introduction and for inviting me to speak to everyone today. And thank you, everyone else who's involved in um, making this happen. And thank you all for coming. Um, I will just share my screen. OK, hopefully you can see uh, my slide. Um, I also have a connection to UCL. I know Bab and many other people here do. I know the Concode Network is supported by UCL. I'm an honorary uh, research fellow at the Department of Information Studies. Um, Despite those affiliations, uh, I come to you as something of an imposter, I think, today, um, because I'm not much of a coder. As Bab said, my background is in book history. Uh, here's my home page. I work on history of particularly cheap prints, early, early printed uh, broadside ballads and chapbooks. Uh, one of my appointments right now is in the Department of Engineering Science in the Visual Geometry Group, which is a well-established computer vision research group, which nowadays, therefore, largely but not wholly as i'll point out largely but not wholly involves machine learning well deep learning in particular but other forms of machine learning uh, but you've been around for longer the group has been around for longer than the current uh, ai boom if you like and therefore has an interesting i think perspective on, on our current moment because we've seen booms come and go um, why is a book historian what is a book historian doing in a uh, computer vision research group you may ask I'm specifically working on this grant, uh, this project grant funded by the EPSRC Visual AI, which is a five year project It kicked off late last year, runs until 2025, and it has two themes. Uh, I, I won't read these out, but uh, uh, the first theme or goal is research and in development. So unsurprisingly, perhaps we do research or research group. We also have a uh, big uh, a big part of the project. Our second goal is transfer and translation. We seek impacts in a variety of other academic disciplines and industry, which today greatly underutilize the power of the latest computer vision ideas. Uh, and humanities and cultural heritage is certainly part of that remit, and that's that's what I, I feel like look after. Um, you can see this shift uh, in the in the kind in the evolution, the development of the kind of tools that. VGG uh, creates and supports. So here are some tools from about five to 10 years ago from our website. And you can see quite clearly from the, the, the visual aspect of these, the titles that these are you know, pretty specialized, uh, uh, heavy duty uh, tools uh, that particularly running on things like MATLAB, which is you know, not much used outside of academia, some parts of industry. And now under this grant and the predecessor grant, Cibabyte, which did much the same thing, we, we, we develop and release tools like this, which you can see from the titles are much more explicable. VG text search, image comparator, face finder, image annotator, and so forth. I'm going to talk about after, uh, about four of these, I think, today. Yes, one, two, three, four. And as part of this, this transfer, it's as, it's as part of this transfer and translation theme that I'm working for VGG. Uh, so my role is to disseminate VGG research to appropriate communities and to recover, uncover research questions, interesting data sets, feature requests, etc. It's a two way process. We don't just want to colonize the humanities and cultural heritage sector, you know, with uh, computer vision methods. We want to find out what it is people in those communities want to do and the contextual understanding they bring to their materials and their research questions and see if um, uh, computer vision methodologists can, can, can serve those needs, but also learn from them. Uh, there are a number of other uh, agendas that we have that I think I should be upfront about, which is 
In particular, cultural heritage or glam organisations have large data sets and good quality metadata. And as everyone here will know, I'm sure machine learning uh, methods uh, and researchers like ourselves, companies like Google, um, have a voracious appetite for data and good quality metadata. And typically that metadata is more refined, isn't it, than, than one can get uh, from scraping the web, that cultural heritage organisations and teams have an interest in ensuring their metadata is as good as it can be. I mean, it may not always be, but they, 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 that's what they want. Uh, that's the goal. Um, there's also an intellectual interest that humanities research, humanities research questions have generally been difficult to address computationally, so we can learn from the kind of uh, from the critical insight that humanists and uh, people in charge of wonderful computer heritage, uh, wonderful cultural heritage research questions uh, bring to the table. And you know, uh, I, I'll just kind of dwell on this point about the images that. that if, if, if you work in a museum or a gallery or in that sector, you, you most probably have things, so visual uh, uh, images that computers have never seen before, as well as those images having a lot of contextual uh, value. So, so that there is genuine technical interest in, in looking at these materials and, and the research questions that go with it and, and the audiences too. And, and there are many kinds of benefits that can come out of these collaborations. That, that which, um, to demonstrate impacts, which is why we have uh, a, a, a translation agenda that supports research software engineers producing the package software that I just shown and will be demonstrating in this in this talk. Um, you know, uh, impact can include new research findings, improved metadata, improved collections management, and as I've been uh, arguing, refinements to methods and software. So just to kind of make the point, cultural heritage organizations have data and many cultural heritage organizations are creating data repositories. So here's the National Library of Scotland's Data Foundry, uh, which is extremely important to a project that I've just done with them. Uh, here is the Glam Labs organization, which is uh, you know, driving this collections as data agenda. And, and these things are absolutely of interest to, to uh, uh, computer scientists, uh, digital humanists, uh, uh, heritage scientists. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, kind of provide entirely new ways of uh, accessing, browsing and, and making making use of uh, transformative uses in some cases of um, uh, uh, the world's uh, it says here, innovative cultural and research institutions and their the materials in their stewardship. OK, so that's by way of uh, introduction as to where I'm coming from and what the group I represent uh, uh, do. Uh, I'm mostly going to talk about our tools uh, and our, our collaborations, but they are sufficiently generic that they're transferable to other tools, other methods which are available. There are many computer vision research groups. I'll refer to uh, some other work during the course of today, but uh, generically um, I'm going to talk about um, some common computer vision tasks, uh, so comparison, spotting the differences essentially. Uh, matching, which is the counterpart of comparison, which is uh, finding out what images have in common or, or finding out which images have things in common might be a better way of putting that. Uh, classification, uh, describing what is in an image as some notion of its content or subject to what it is as a general grouping, a general thing. And that the subcategory of classification, which is object detection, which is um, not both describing what is in an image, but also locating that thing in an image. So providing um, some, um, some coordinates and geo coordinates for the location of a thing. Um, OK, so starting off with comparison. I'm going to generically outline the task in uh, many of these cases and then show how the software that my colleagues produce addresses that. So the task here is spot the difference. And uh, I'm going to, uh, many of my examples will be drawn from book history, which is my background, not all of them. So I'm just going to invite you very briefly to spot the difference between these two lines of printed text. And you know, perhaps you could, for the record, put in the chat if you can spot the difference. So I'll give you just uh, five seconds should be sufficient. I don't actually have the chat window open in front of me. I'm on two screens, so I can't see what people are saying. But you may have spotted that the eye in Lucius at the end here is inverted at the bottom here which is a typographical variance from error, if you want to be moralistic about it, but very much a feature of early printed books. You know, these are not like paperbacks, they are all essentially handmade and they're full of differences. 
And if you're an editor or a book historian, you may have an interest in those differences to, in order to improve the text or to just understand how the book is made. Spotting the difference with the conventional means that is hard in a large page of text like this. And here is you know, Alan Sugar of The Apprentice. I don't know if that's still a thing. Modeling uh, the so-called Wimbledon method of image comparison. You know, so it's, it's relatively straightforward, isn't it? Where I've isolated two snippets of a book uh, and invite you to find a difference. But if you're looking at two pages as a whole, you can, you're not sure if there are differences there. That is challenging. And um, book historians have developed uh, a kind of rather wonderful uh, menagerie of machines, uh, of contraptions, you might say, to help them to spot the difference. So here's four of them in a rare book. Uh, library at the University of Virginia. I won't go through all of them, but here's uh, one of them. This is one of them I've actually used, the, the McLeod Collator and its inventor. And what's going on here is that uh, Randall McLeod, um, who's a, a book historian, scholar, bibliographer and um, inventor, um, is looking at two copies of a book, of the same edition of a book, one of them in one eye and through a system of mirrors and blinds, the other one through the other eye. And each it, it, so each book is uh, one book per eye. And because in this sort of normal, uh, quote unquote, normal human visual processing system, um, we have two eyes and uh, stereoscopy resolves uh, those two input streams in the brain to one. Any difference that between uh, the two books will kind of flicker in and out of focus. It's kind of a curious sensation. It's rather like an optical illusion where you can see one state uh, uh, of a picture at once at one time, but you can't see both state, uh, both both pictures like uh, you know famous uh, famous ones, the two rab the rabbits in the vase, in the hair, things like that. And uh, the same is true of uh, books that have otherwise or otherwise identical but have small differences. And you can do that for maybe an hour or so, and then you get uh, a headache, or seasick, or you ruin your eyes. Uh, we think that uh, software can help with this, and uh, we developed a thing called the Traherne Digital Collator uh, for the benefit of uh, the uh, Oxford edition, the Oxford Traherne project, which is aiming to produce a new edition of the works of the 17th century uh, theologian and poet Thomas Traherne. So their job is to go through, is, is to find digital images of as many copies of Traherne's works as they can, and then to go through them looking for variations, which might be extremely small, as in the case of my inverted eye, well, they might be quite major. Then they may be re represent revisions of the text that happened during production, uh, which have stayed because have, this, have stayed around because uh, all the earlier states have stayed around because paper is expensive. You don't throw it away. So um, many copies of many uh, iconic works, um, and I showed Shakespeare earlier, uh, exhibit these variations. So what Traherne does is presents you you, you input images. I'll, I'll show a demo shortly. And it presents you with visualizations like this. So here's a detail of the two large pages I showed earlier. And you can see this word at the bottom of the page, which is so called catch word, which is for the benefit of the bookbinder, is different. And you know, this is strictly an observational task. You, know, you observe the difference, you make a note of it, and, and you know, what it all means is a different order uh, research question. But you know, this 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 tool is just of course aimed at the first instance of finding the difference, and, and, and it's set up as a purely visual tool. It doesn't do any variation detection. I mean, it possibly could, particularly in conjunction with OCR, and that is something that's been discussed. Uh, for these people, this audience, they don't particularly want it for, for reasons that are, I think are quite interesting, important, you can go into those if people ask. Um, um, so it just kind of does this flip view. Um, we have other visualizations as well, so we can show or maybe I'll save that for later on time, different visualizations of difference. Um, how does it work? Uh, it doesn't, isn't just a kind of strict kind of A, B um, uh, uh, presentation. It also does some, some matching. It does this by means of uh, uh, so-called local features, which are these red ellipsoids you see here. So these are, these are uh, 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 so-called SIFT features, which are uh, uh, demarcated by transitions in texture or contrast across the face of an image. So you can see here uh, this system has found matching features across uh, these two photographs, an object in these two photographs from different angles. So that's one step in the Traherne workflow. First of all, it identifies matching features 
and then it performs a transformation to register the two together so you can get a visually smooth um, presentation of the differences. And that's helpful because it can do things like cope with curved pages, which is common in books and a headache for that kind of transformation. So I've got a little visualization here and you'll see shortly the book. OK, there, if you, if you saw that difference there, we went from a straight, if you like, a flat registration to a curved registration. And now we've got a, a magnifying glass tool, which is in, which is showing some of the differences. So the ability to warp and register uh, certain kinds of geometries using uh, the, the method here is, is a thin plate splines. So if people are familiar with um, that uh, visual transformation, you can imagine a kind of a metal plate that's deformable along some axes, uh, but it's not deformable, uh, you know, around its core axis, if you like. So, so that's that's um, how that is done, and it has applications in any kind, other kinds of documents and images. So here it is working on. Music. This is some uh, Puccini score, uh, which the scholar is yes, editing a new edition of Puccini performance is interesting. Um, and you can just see a, a quick, I'll just show that again. So, so a successive states of the survey map with developments uh, taking place over time. Uh, altered photographs. So there's a very famous image of Joseph Stalin and uh, associates who, who, uh, who fell foul of him and was, was erased literally and visually. Um, other kinds of visual materials. So here again, this is Shakespeare, and here's an engraving from Shakespeare's first folio, which was again also during production. So the artist touched up the, uh, the hair and the eyebrow and so forth, and uh, you know this gives us, uh, you know, is a visual and cultural interest, and also gives us if, if, if we if we're interested in the sequence of copies of a book, or uh, that gives us uh, gives us insights to that as well. And I would think of particular interest for this community is uh, before and after images of restoration of painting. So here, of course, the Ghent altarpiece. And you know, here's before and after the recent massive uh, restoration works that have uh, completed, I think, only just last year or the year before. That is quite a smooth registration, and it helps that we have very high quality face uh, uh, um, um, uh, large images, and, and, and that the materials are flat. If they aren't flat, it's problematic. Um, th this this task of image registration is by no means something that we alone work on. It's a very general interest for uh, conservation uh, scientists and picture re researchers. And uh, I just want to draw attention to some of this work, which was presented at a webinar that you can find on YouTube, hosted by the National Gallery. Joe Padfield, the National Gallery, put together a killer lineup of people working on some aspects of image registration. I particularly recommend um, the work of Robert Erdman at the Rijksmuseum, but also VNA's own Luca Carini, who's, who's actually misspelled here as Luna Carini, and uh, various others. It's a really uh, vibrant community of people working on this and, and uh, with um, sharing methods, sharing code, and uh, making progress. Uh, we've got a demo online of uh, uh, what we now call image comparator. So it was Traherne, now it's image comparator, and we still have Traherne, but MCOMP is a more generic tool. Uh, so I rebranded it, and I'll just give a kind of quick demo of it. If I can get it to load. There's a new version coming very shortly as well, which runs wholly in a web browser. I mean, the code executes in the web browser is JavaScript. But this runs on a server in Oxford and um, has a kind of toy interface in which you can uh, select some uh, some materials and you know, press compare. That runs on the server. So again, these are books. Uh, we have a kind of nice magnifying glass tool like so. Uh, I want to show just some of the other uh, transformations we have. So an overlay, um, a difference view in which one book or channel, if you like, is in or the ink at any rate, is in red and one is in blue. And that's that's quite uh, good for kind of uh, flipping through these uh, sort of two copies of books like this for uh, uh, um, uh, easy, uh, quickly. Uh, toggle control, which um, I'm not sure why that is actually still. Oh, yes, I know what it's going to So that's my default visualizations toggle recall in this, this version. We have a fade which we can control like this, and we have uh, uh, the inevitable curtain viewer type thing, which uh, again came out of the Rijksmuseum. And we have actually horizontal and vertical, 
and uh, Luca at the DNA was showing a great demo of this functionality uh, overlaying uh, uh, multispectral images and natural light images or um, X-rays, things like that. Um, and here we have a number of transformations. So here's the thin plate spline transformation I mentioned, which, which copes with a degree of curvature that's not perfect and has others as well. Okay, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint now. Um, moving on, uh, matching, finding out what images have in common. Uh, we use, um, sorry, I'm just getting ahead of myself. Uh, in, in image recognition terms, this is uh, known as uh, instance-based image recognition. So, so the task here is to find images of the same object as opposed to category-based images, which is finding all the airplanes. So what, what class of object does this, this belong to is the task here. Um, and we use actually the same tech as we do with image comparator for this. I mean, there are various ways of doing it, but these, these again, these, these red ellipsoids are these SIF features. Um, which we um, extract and make searchable through this tool, BGG Image Search Engine Vice. You can show see here similar materials, buildings, uh, uh, features of buildings, facades of buildings, uh, made matching. We have um, uh, Silsco, this is all free. And everything I'm showing is, is free and open source, by the way. And we have increasingly graphical installers for it. So you can either compile it yourself, you can run it in Docker, we have, we have instructions for that. Or increasingly, we have, like I say, GUI installers uh, at the moment for Windows. Mac is coming, I think, very soon, in like, you know, weeks, certainly. Uh, and um, like I say, code is available for Linux and um, indeed other platforms. Uh, these SIFT features, just to explain what they are, uh, they're geometric features defined by differences in texture. The SI in SIFT stands for scale invariance. Size doesn't matter to a large extent, as long as there's some some information there. So you saw that through the uh, building features, which were at different, different sizes. And they also survive rotation and skewing, uh, but not flipping or warping, um, unless we tell it that an image is flipped or warped. So features have to be on the same plane, which details on the facade of a building always are. Uh, we add up SIF features in a so-called bag of visual words model, which is a metaphor we take from a bag of words model from computational linguistics in which you essentially do away with any kind of notion of extracting or asserting grammatical structure in a text or semantic structure. You simply um, uh, treat um, documents uh, as aggregations, statistical aggregations of, of, of units, words in this case. And we do the same uh, with, with images. Uh, this, this system has no understanding of the semantics, no high level understanding on this image, it just understands these humans uh, through these transitions in texture. Uh, a quick demo of this in, in action. So this is a project we did uh, with the National Library of Scotland using data from their data boundary site, which I, I showed previously. Um, we took the chat books printed in Scotland data set, which is uh, some um, 40,000 page images. And we're interested in illustrations, uh, which are reused across different publications. And I'll, I'll demo uh, what we've got here. So actually, this is the, this, so this is the landing page uh, for this project. We have we have um, code, a paper. We link back to the data set. We have some publications and lectures. I'm going to show go to the demo it's online. Uh, some title pages of these books, which are cheap pamphlets for popular culture. Uh, we have metadata, uh, courtesy of the NLS, lovely metadata on, for example, the imprint, so the place of publication or information about publication given on the front. I can browse that slightly awkwardly to uh, examples of these chat books that don't say who they were printed, when, and uh, who printed them, when, and where. And, and where. So, so there's an absence of information about where they come from. But I can select one of these illustrated pages in Vice. So this is the out-of-the-box software that comes with um, with the comes with a it comes with the front end, the uh, Vice download. And I see the NLS's data uh, metadata gives an approximate date of publication. I guess the imprint just says, like I said, entered according to order, which is a kind of form of words. But in Vice, I can I can select a region of the page and press search and it will very quickly as you see that was in real time retrieve 
what it thinks of as candidate matches. So I can ask it to show me more if I like, and those that hopefully be relevant. And I'll go on, and uh, these are almost all relevant until you get to the bottom. And there is a bottom end at which the system starts returning irrelevance and nonsensical results, as well as slightly different results. You can see this lozenge shape here is different from this, this box. But if I go back to some of the top results, I see, for example, this publication does have information about the place of printing. And we have again a comparison tool that allows me, the scholar, to verify that what they're looking at is an off print of the same block, the same wooden block that which had the, the technology that was used at this time to print these, these cheap images, these cheap publications. It's gotten a bit damaged and there is some warping which is could due to various ways, it, reasons it could be photography, there's variations in inking I can see, um, there's uh, invariably often the paper shrinks a little bit and you have to kind of bear these things in mind, but I'm confident uh, based on just experience really that these are off prints off the same block and that allows me to to wonder if this metadata is relevant to my first publication and we have a number of other bells and whistles in in, in this tool we have an upload tool which i won't demonstrate because it doesn't work terribly well at the moment i'm sorry that's slightly scandalous it it, it's, it does work actually but it, it's just a bit slow and it requires small image speed. so you can upload an image from outside the system get a visual match and we also have these, we have these visual groupings where we clustered matching illustrations right from the start. So you can make a browse, see a browsable gallery of a bunch of these at once, and that's convenient. So this is my, my obviously my um, first image, and it's convenient for you know doing kind of uh, annotation at scale to have this, this kind of view. Okay, back to PowerPoint. Um, to uh, feel free to play with any of these demos and to you know feedback would be very much welcome as well as uh, use on other projects and you know it can vice can i have successfully used vice to match many of these things tiled surfaces work really well because there's, there's a good pattern in there mosaics coins are, can in theory be done but it's quite difficult because the relief is shallow and there's low contrast across the face of the coin uh, any kind of impression impre a matrix and in, impression surface that creates impressions though is, uh, is 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 good so printing surfaces like blocks and plates and their off prints and also it's, it's useful for duplicating for, for deduplicating image files that have small differences and i'll show both of those use cases so here is a printing block and it's off print uh, there are some supposed visual matches here but actually they're spurious if you look closely at you you'll see that almost all of them don't correspond this is just statistical noise. And the reason this is just statistical noise is because, as I said earlier, Vice can't work if the images are flipped as face on images of uh, printed blocks and their impressions are. If you think of back to potato printing, they are flipped. So if I flip my block image, as I've done here, and I've also done some processing, I've done some, I think I thresholded this and used levels to it in Photoshop and combination of things. And, uh, we get a very good match indeed. So this is highly useful if you have an unattributed printing block or similar in your collection. And I um, do research into printing surfaces, which is um, a kind of a growing area of interest among, uh, among uh, book historians. And uh, many institutions have unattributed printing surfaces, but they, they may have candidate books that these, these uh, items may have been used in. And if you can process those um, at scale, as Vice can do, you have a good chance to be able to match it. And here's an example of a project at scale. Uh, and this is, isn't so much matching for purposes of these kind of forensic purposes. This is more kind of like data management. So the Ashmolean, uh, like, like many institutions, people had a problem, has a problem, um, less than it used to, thanks to Vice actually, but certainly had a problem with uh, duplicate images. So they handed us over 262,000 images. And so we know there are duplicates in there, but it's hard for us to find them. And we use Vice to find, for example, oh, it's bottom of my screen is cut out. Um, I assure you it is we've had something like 97,000 of those images were identical in just in two copies. So and, and by I mean identical, I mean exactly the same file, with the only difference being that the file name had changed. So at a certain point, you know, in the, uh, in images have moved, then they've moved back. It's a common scenario. 
and only the file name was different, so they were identical files. And because the file name was different, a checksum wouldn't pick up, wouldn't, wouldn't match them. So we use visual features to do the matching, uh, which we also uh, interrogated, we verified by using, by doing a pixel-wise comparison with the tool we've now released. And this is a bit of code for you, finally. So you're wondering where is the code coming in, but here is some code, this little Python tool that um, came out from the command line. Um, and uh, it, it does, uh, compares uh, each pixel um, with each other picks and uses to verify that this visual matching is robust for these for this purpose. Um, and we can also, as you, you'll imagine from my previous examples, use uh, Vice in, in a collection such as the Ashmoleans to find crops, resizes, images that have been reformatted, images that have already been imaged, uh, and you, you might want for conservation purposes to check if it's been imaged before, or for the purposes of ordering images, it may you know that for, for many organisations, finding out if something has been digitised is, is, is you know that's a, a number not straightforward. It may be a morning's work or, or more, or maybe even an hour's work. But uh, as you see in the visual matching, is fast, uh, so it, it's kind of useful in that scenario as well. Let's see how am I doing for time? I guess I've got about twelve minutes, maybe about. You think? Yeah, uh, I think we said two or quarter two, so yeah, you're good. Okay. You're good. Um, that's, that's great. Um, so moving on to my kind of my last major kind of family of uh, uh, methods, tasks in computer vision classification. Um, it's the content or subjects from the image. And just going to repeat my slide I showed earlier, it's the distinction between classification, um, category search, and uh, instance based search. Um, which we typically do with neural networks. Um, and image classification is one of the great successes of, of neural networks, isn't it? It's one of the uh, convolutional neural networks. And uh, apologies for those of you who, which is probably most of you, have a very good and perhaps even a very detailed understanding of how these systems work. Um, typically, what one does is select an untrained uh, model train it by example using labeled examples and at least in, the, in a in a supervised machine learning scenario we need label uh, uh, labeled examples for training uh, of cats and dogs and then moving to inference we, we provide a we give the trained model a new image it hasn't seen before and it will output a confidence score of what it has seen um, so you know we'll all be familiar with these i just want to really sort of talk about the application of these in, in, in this domain. So we did a project with Art UK, Visual Search of Paintings. Uh, formerly Art UK was formerly Your Paintings. And we have a number of image search modes. You can search by color, by texture, but also by object. And we provide a front end that, that leverages Google, because Google is a good source of uh, retraining images. So we take a trained model, um, which, sorry, this, this, this is a rather, um, rather complex diagram in some ways. So we processed the you were painting the Art UK data set with a CNN that was originally trained on ImageNet, a large uh, database ImageNet data set, which is instrumental in training and benchmarking and advancing uh, image recognition. And then in the front end, uh, we provide, we obtain retraining images from a Google keyword search. So the Google search for beard produces um, images of men with beards, uh, from which a CNN extracts some features, which are positive training examples in our scenarios, uh, scenario which is input to a classifier. We can, if we like, offline provide negative training examples, which obviously have to be specific to the search scenario. So in this case, these are things that are not men with beards or just beards, and um, those are also uh, input to the classifier, which uh, is uh, um, um, apply to the features extracted from the IEK data set and outputs paintings of many bids. And we have an online demo for this. You know, so the URL of it uh, I'll, show, uh, I'll, I'll share later. It's uh, uh, a box of painting search will retrieve it as well. So, and we can find, you know, kind of quite simple objects fairly often reliably. Uh, arches, uh, boats, boats or ships, craft anyway. Uh, 
dogs for the most part, but this, this is kind of interesting. It's a really great example of how bias uh, affects the performance of the classifier. So these are mostly our images of dogs, but some of them are mixed and some of them don't actually contain dogs at all. So here's an Alfred Munnings painting of horses, a uh, hunting, uh, hunting scene. And I've looked hard, but I can't see a single dog in this. And this is, this is a, a consequence of, of course, the fact that the kind of material that is in our UK, you know, so the English oil painting, um, largely oil painting, um, uh, uh, it's, well, so our UK started out with oil paintings, but I think there are now not more than oil paintings in, in our UK. Um, there are many images of uh, hunting scenes in that data set. So the classify, there's two parts of this. The, the misclassification results from the fact that dogs and horses are visually somewhat similar. I mean, they're quadrupeds. Uh, and the, but more specifically, that because dogs and horses co-occur in the training data, we have these scenes of, uh, of dogs and horses hunting. The classifier, the, is, it, it, the, the data is insufficiently granular for the classifiers to learn features very specific to dogs. So this is a great example of bias and a great advantage in, in machine learning and AI. And, and the value in some ways of um, doing this in the visual domain is you get to see what the classifier is quote unquote thinking, you know, rather predicting. It's not really thinking, you know, you, of course, in any recognizable human sense. Um, here's just the uh, tool it's, uh, that we use for our UK and other projects. We're also working on video as we have Vice as well. So VGG image classification engine or VIC, which is based on a ResNet architecture, which uh, takes a lot of inspiration from VGG neural networks of around about 2015, I want to say, things like VGG 16 and VGG 19 you might have come across. Uh, and we support AAAF, uh, which was a great value, of course, for people in museums, cultural heritage organizations, so we can just provide a AAAF collection URI to the uh, at, at training stage and the uh, VIC will, will, will ingest images and metadata uh, by, uh, from, from that address, um, which is handy. And uh, there are many other ways in which we could work better with AAAF and things like image comparison, which I know uh, VNA and others are very interested in. But I'll go into that now. So just very quickly to kind of round up, um, object detection, which as I uh, say, is, it can be seen as a kind of refinement of classification. So not just um, uh, detecting an object, but locating it, as you might do, for example, if, if you are developing uh, self-driving cars or, or, or surveilling a street scene and you want to identify people and vehicles and maybe other things such as umbrellas. So there's a screenshot here of um, object detection using uh, uh, Google's efficiency debt uh, model. Uh, trained on COCO, uh, Microsoft COCO, which is uh, commonly used to benchmark uh, object detection and also classification algorithms. So it has bounding boxes and sometimes pixel wise segmentation masks as well around things of interest. So technically these are things or objects in, in object detection parlance and everything else is stuff. So there, there's a binary of things and stuff in uh, object detection world. And it's always worth paying attention to, you know, how these data sets are put together. And actually the paper that introduces COCO is unusually descriptive about how COCO is put together uh, using, in this case, Mechanical Turk workers. And this may be a consideration, you know, where it's certainly always a consideration in terms of bias. It may be a consider consideration in terms of uh, accreditation of labor, maybe a consideration in, in thinking about the conditions of labor uh, under which a machine learning model was created and other things like power are also considerations as uh, any of you who've been following or participating in debates about AI and ethics would know and we can talk about that um, after the presentation by all means if you like. So um, we took efficient debt train on COCO and we applied it, uh, I say we, this is my colleague Abhishek Dutta who did the heavy lifting, we applied it to the NLS chat books data set, I'm sorry there's a typo there, it should be NLS and this is the labeling stage. So we, 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 we're, we're labeling things of interest and uh, which the illustration. So we want, we want to tell the detector to just, you know, come back with bounding boxes for, that only contain illustrations. Uh, some positive results here, those are well and good. And we use this, to, this nice annotation tool, Lisa, to review results as well. So, so we've got back JSON with coordinates 
of the uh, of the objects of interest. I, mean, I can load this in the web browser you know, with the data uh, and refine them in some cases. So there's a GUI that allows me to uh, reset the bounding boxes and delete them if necessary or add more. Uh, some numbers. Um, it was essentially highly successful, more than we were expecting, given the model was so generic. But it works as follows. So first of all, first of all Avashek manually annotated 337 pages. Then he handed the, the, the train model over to me, which I then applied to, I looked at 20,000 images in, which actually didn't take very long because we had this nice interface. You could just scroll through and check that things are in order. Mostly they were. If they weren't, it didn't take long to refine them. Uh, so I handed back over 1,600 or so predicted annotations. We retrained, repeat, revise, review, and the output is a bunch of illustrations and their regions and a trained model. Um, always interesting to look at where it fall, fell down. So false positives include things like show through. So the paper is thin. The illustration is shown through from the other page. That would be quite hard to train out unless you're able to give the classifier some understanding of, if you like, the architecture of the book, which you could do. Um, things as well that are kind of understandable in QPP stamps. Uh, this is a little bit more borderline because this, as far as I'm concerned, this is not relevant um, because I happen not to be interested in these printers ornaments. But it's hard to articulate, and it's a research question, I think, so it's how can we explain what we're looking for in terms that computers can understand? Of course, they, computers don't really tolerate ambiguity very well, but ambiguity is something you might be extremely interested in in many of these, um, these, these projects. And it brings up something that I hints at earlier, like another question that um, if we're working with cultural heritage materials, are we content to uh, you reuse generic models like efficient text, like image next? Or do we need to need to train on domain specific materials from the ground up? You know, we have these large models that have been created over you now many years, sort of uh, hundreds, some cases, thousands of years of personal labor. Uh, would there be a case for throwing those out and training only on materials that are pertaining to particular domain? Uh, this is a live debate. Um, the 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 you know the the, the, the accuracy and the ethics to some extent of, of, of transfer learning. So, and here's a great paper about this issue that, that exact uh, asks precisely whether ImageNet pre-training is of use for classifying historical documents. Uh, the upshot of this, this was simply a, a study of accuracy, of, of, of precision of retrieval, and the, the, the result of this study, which is great, you know, a great uh, paper, was that yes, it was. Yes, it, it was useful to retrain, certainly on the kind of very generic uh, ImageNet classes. So ImageNet has a good understanding of basic shapes and colors and textures. So, you know, you might want to start with that perhaps and refine as we did with the chat books. Um, but certainly I come across people who have an interest in, in training from scratch, and I think this is a live question. Um, we have done a bit of uh, research on this ourselves with testing the chat books model and other book illustrations. So this is a much a more expensive uh, uh, elite book and has lots of color in it and it worked pretty well. So the model is reusable and uh, it's also retrainable. And here, here is some more code. Here is some more Python code for appropriate to this, this gathering. Uh, this, we're hoping to get this in a Google Colab soon, which should be helpful for, for workshops um, with the, particularly for likes of me. Uh, so I can, I can at least step through a Colab or Jupyter or something. Um, just kind of round up, you know, with with kind of more kind of research questions or, or I've, I've talked a lot about what computer vision can do on sort of just round up with things that it can't do, which is do really do proper iconography such as retrieve the nativity of uh, Christian uh, folklore. Uh, what is a nativity? You know, as a, as a professional art historian, we would understand it. A nativity always contains a baby, usually a woman, sometimes also kings, shepherds, celestial light and other of these these things. You know, maybe we can teach this through compound classification to understand that an activity is a contextual intersection of unique elements and, and that only with certain elements being present or with certain contexts being present or with an understanding perhaps of a kind of high level understanding of this is Western art, this is Christian art, something like that. Uh, could we work on uh, um, something like this? Um, the other end of the kind of classification scale, if you like, you know, so this is uh, a form of fine grains image recognition, but it's different from my instance based recognition where I'm retrieving 
impressions of the same blocks. So what we've got here is copies, and that's different from either instance-based search or category search. So these are botanical illustrations, and the one on the right is copied from the one on the left. And you know, it may take you a while to get your eye in, but if you look at certain features here, so this, this, this kind of pod here, you know, these structures around the root, uh, this structure here, those are your smoking guns. And you know, a, a lot of the interest, I think, in uh, uh, the study of uh, artifacts like this is in, is in the communication, is in the, you know, the sociology, in fact, of relationships, not so much the kind of either the, the, the micro uh, resemblances, which are denoted by material bibliographical relationships, or the macro, that this is just a plant of a certain species. I mean, we, we're interested in that as well, and we have done work on that as well. But the modeling of, you know, specific expressive relationships, I think is something that computer vision is not good at at the moment. OK, uh, I'm going to leave that there. Uh, there are some links uh, to things that I've shown. I'm also going to uh, put some links to these slides uh, in the chat and uh, would be delighted to take any questions. Or discuss more. Uh, Thank you, yeah. I'll just stop sharing. And where I'll find the things. I'll try and stop highlighting, stop highlighting. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. And it's really good to see practical tools as well. You know, it's really, really, really useful and heritage specific as well. So it's really, really nice. Brilliant. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I've got one or two. Um, yeah. yeah, I kind of going back to the example of the chap books, um, I was interested because you had the drop down where it was kind of relatively messy metadata. So I was wondering to what extent was the metadata like cleaned from the MLS beforehand? And then also once this tool was built, did that help clean up metadata afterwards? Um, yeah, we actually had both uh, clean authorized metadata and kind of messy, if you like, diplomatic transcripts. So the imprint, we had that, that was an uncontrolled transcription of what, what it was on the front of the book. But we also had authorized metadata for um, term printer and publisher and author terms. Um, and they came from two different places, actually. So there was one set was in the um, data set there, the download from the foundry. And um, I just put the URL to my slides in the chat, the PDF is from my slides. Um, another set came from their catalog. So in terms of, you know, recognizing labor and, you know, I, I could have said more about this. And the, the value of metadata, they, this is a great example because you've got decades actually of curatorial labor and establishing of those authorities and scholarship. And there's a lot of times in which they've already got there ahead of me and they know that a chat book was printed in Glasgow, although it doesn't say so because they just know. So um, that really helps with making the images browsable. And it could help as well in other scenarios. So if you want to learn the visual style, of, so I feel like I can recognize a Robert Hutchison illustration. Um, I don't know who the 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 cross people were. We don't know anything about them in most cases. Sometimes we do. So there are some quite famous wood engravers. Thomas Buick did work with this type. Uh, often we don't. But you know, having that structured metadata is useful. Clean metadata it would be is is essential for that kind of that classification at that level. Um, as for uh, the Closing the loop. I mean, this is very much part of the Data Foundry's mission. I'm actually kind of meeting with Sarah Ames, who's the Digital Scholarship Librarian, quite soon and hoping to sort of continue this conversation. So rather than it just being, you know, kind of something that we've taken, you know, we've taken something from the NLS and we've done this technical work, we can feed back findings like we have found uh, identified printers, we can identify place um, cloud publication, like I say, in some cases, um, dating as well as another thing. We can provide contain sequences of publications from where and to the blog. Um, so, yeah, does that answer your question? I feel like yeah. that's a general kind of. Uh, oh, no, definitely. That was really cool. Thank you. Um, I have other questions, but if anyone else wants to go first. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, please feel free to raise a hand or pop it in the chat and I can read it out. Or <clears throat> it's very interesting how um, some of the misclassifications 
reminds me of um, one of the early machine learning problems where they uh, chihuahuas and uh, chihuahuas and what was the what was the thing I was misclassifying on? Uh, muffins were being misclassified. <laughs> the machine learning algorithms were confusing the two. There was if you Google the it, it, and the gun wasn't there, or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and these things are easily they're very they're very fragile. They're very uh, you know can adversarial effects, but attacks, but just kind of flipping a pixel or you know someone wearing kind of funky makeup can spoof many facial recognition classifiers. And we also do facial recognition, and that's a whole other conversation, now, of course, about accuracy, bias, uh, ethics, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we we'll do facial recognition on animals, so we've done a thing on uh, chimpanzee colonies. Yeah, kind of. Oh, sorry. I know. Uh, just about to say, like, definitely with the labelling. Like, mm. I mean, you mentioned labelling, and Emily's. I know who's done. I oh. drew thirteen thousand tiny boxes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, oops, I yeah. raised my hand inadvertently there. Um, yeah, no, I'm definitely keen to kind of highlight the. I think the term data cleanup doesn't really do justice to, or even data capture. These terms don't really do justice to the importance of it. Um, you know, it's machine learning is, as, as you know, lives or dies on data. And it's why we produce annotation tools. So at least I showed, we also have Via, which is a very simple bit of JavaScript and HTML, runs in a web browser, it's a few hundred K uh, to, to streamline this process. Now it puts annotations in Cocoa format fairly standard uh, for image classification. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess with the the air that you were getting from the horses versus dogs, um, that was a classification algorithm, not object detection, right? Sure. Um, so I guess, do you think object detection would be worth it in that scenario? Because then you could find the horses and not be dogs, or is it too much work on that particular data set? Something it's a classic, like yeah, no, it would be I mean, it's a classic often as object detection demo to see the horse and the rider. And you could maybe add in that you know, the kind of understanding of the relate. If, if you can understand the scene as a whole, I think you can do a lot more for classification. Um, like yeah, that's interesting. Where our things are in relation to each other in the ground. And stuff. It, it seems like the next step, doesn't it? For machine learning to understand these relationships to improve the, you know, you, see, mm, I think you, can, you can pick out people and cars and things now quite happily, but not the relationships are quite interesting. And again, it's how, you know, it, it's another example of how primitive these things are compared to say, you know, real iconography or real, you know, sort of descriptive analysis of um, the complex painting that is exactly is relational and the, Elements uh, have exist in the hierarchy, uh, you know, internally, but also in reference to, of course, everything else. Mm. Okay. Any, any more questions? Um, coming up to five to six, and I know you, you're, you've got another event, and I've got another meeting as well. <laughs> so I think uh, we can we start. Drawing it to close. Shall I, um, do you have any more questions, Emily, or anyone? No, I'm okay. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm gonna, shall I stop the recording here and we can just, we can like let people, um, we can just let people, um, let me just stop recording. Uh, uh, do uh, ping me, uh, drop me a line, get me on Twitter if you have any more questions or um, um, on yeah. And thanks. Thank Brilliant. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It was, was great to see the whole roundup of all those different tools that we could use. Yeah. Well, I do I have some question of this presentation as well. So mm. if that's yeah. all to you, colleagues, students, then I can, I can do one of those. Um, I'm trying to evolve with colleagues a sort of intermediate level version of that event as well that involves um, code of some sort, but there's relatively little people can just play.